In this short video, we're going to talk about a new type of integral called a surface integral. So let's review a bit first. We learned about double integrals where we took a domain in the xy plane, we subdivided it into a number of cells, and we estimated the value of the integral by taking a sample point of the function represents a surface times the area of the course power. And then we let uh, the number of cells go to infinity. And that gave us our integral. So our domain of integration is a planar region in the xy plane, and the integrand is a function of two variables. And then we looked at a change of variables. We're still looking at a domain of integration, which is a planar region, but now it's in a new variable space. It's in a UV plane. And we needed to change three things. So we needed to change our domain of integration. We needed to change our function to be now a function of our parameters, u and v. And then we needed to change this differential. And we saw that the differential would need to be multiplied by the absolute value of the Jacobian. And where did that Jacobian come from? Well, we were able to perform a mapping and say, oh, our region over here can be approximated by the area of this parallelogram, which is essentially the magnitude of delta u times r, the partial derivative of r with respect to u, crossed with delta v times the partial derivative of r with respect to v. Now, in this particular case, because it's a planar region, we only got the k component out of that cross product. So its length was just the absolute value of that single component. Well, we could perform the same type of analysis with surface integrals. And so in surface integrals, we're going to have for our domain of integration, not the integrand, but for the domain of integration, instead of being a planar surface, so a portion of the xy plane, it's going to be a portion of a general surface. So what would I do? Well, I would take this general surface, subdivide it into a number of cells, and then I would take a sample point in each cell, multiply that times the area of the cell. Now notice that the, I say the function, uh, the integrand, the integrand doesn't represent this surface. The integrand is just some function of x, y, and z. But since the domain of integration is a surface where z is a function of x and y, uh, I could just replace z with its corresponding definition of x and y. So ultimately, it really, this function value only depends on uh, x and y in this integral. But anyway, I would take that sample value, multiply it times the area of the cell. And then if I let the number of cells go to infinity, I'll get the surface integral. Again, that's the area of each cell. Now, if I use a parametric representation for this surface S, we learn that the ds here is really just this same expression that we used to get the Jacobian, the magnitude of the r vector, the partial vector of r, excuse me, the partial derivative of r with respect to u crossed with 
the partial derivative of r with respect to v. And so I could write my surface integral as the double integral over r of f now converted to u and v, my parameters, times, well, the magnitude of r sub u cross r sub v times the dA. Now the dA has got to be appropriate for this region r, and that region r is the parametric region in the parameter plane, the uv plane. Now we abbreviate writing f in terms of u and v as f of r of u comma v. Let's look at an example. I'd like to evaluate the surface integral of x squared ds, where my surface is the unit sphere. So we saw a parametric representation uh, for a unit sphere, I believe. If not, what do we do? We use uh, something that looks like polar coordinates. You would say, what happened to rho? Well, on the unit sphere, we're only looking at the surface. We're not looking at a solid, only the surface. And on the surface, rho is identically equal to 1. So my parametric representation would just have x being sine phi cosine theta, y equals sine phi sine theta, and z equals cosine phi. Those would be my spherical coordinate equations, but with rho set to 1. Well, let's take the partial with respect to phi. I'll get these components. Take the partial with respect to theta. I'll get these components. And again, I write these two vectors under each other because I know I want to take the cross product. So I'll just put an i hat, j hat, and the k hat above that. And that'll help me calculate it without having to write out the full determinant. And so now my components here are, well, the ith component, I get a zero minus a minus, which would be a plus sine squared phi cosine theta. Then for the jth component, I get sine squared phi sine theta. And then for the k component, I get this really long expression, but See, I have a common factor of sine phi cosine phi. And if I factor that out inside the parentheses, I have cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. So that'll just be one. So this simplifies to, in the k component, to just being sine phi cosine phi. Well, I need the magnitude of that. Well, before I do that, let me note that I have a common factor of sine phi. And that's kind of interesting because if I factor out the sine phi, what is left inside my uh, vector? It's exactly my x, y, and z. It's exactly the representation of the uh, position vector of the point on that particular sphere. And that should make sense uh, based on what we know about a sphere. We know that the uh, uh, tangent plane is orthogonal to a, a vector that goes through the center of the sphere. All right, let's take the magnitude. Sine of phi is just a positive constant because remember phi only goes between zero and pi. And for those values, uh, phi is never negative. So I can just leave that as sine phi, and then take the square root of the sum of the squares. But when I square the first two terms, now I've got a cosine squared theta and a sine squared theta with a common factor of sine squared phi. So that will simplify to sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi, which will simplify to one. So I'm left with the magnitude of the cross product just being sine of phi. All right, so let's 
perform the evaluation. I have to evaluate the integral of x squared ds. So I'm going to see that ds will be sine phi times dA. So sine phi times dA. In this, in this case, my uh, parameters are phi and theta. So dA would be just d phi d theta. X is sine phi cosine theta. So x squared, my integrand, would be that value squared. And phi goes from 0 to pi. Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So I can go ahead and uh, multiply that out. I'm going to factor out the cosine squared theta. I'm going to replace sine squared phi with 1 minus cosine squared phi. And so when I multiply that out, the antiderivative of sine phi would be minus cosine phi. The antiderivative of minus cosine squared phi times sine phi after a u substitution would just be plus one third cosine cubed phi. And I'll evaluate that between zero and pi. That's just going to be a constant. That'll be four thirds. So I'm left with evaluating the integral from zero to two pi of cosine squared theta d theta. So I'll use the identity, uh, one half, one plus cosine of two theta. And after I evaluate that, I get 4 pi over 3. Before we look at our next type of surface integral, we're going to have to take a brief moment to talk about oriented surfaces. So if I have a surface where z is a function of x and y, then in that situation, it's, there's, the surface will always have a top side and a bottom side. So you're going to have two possible normal vectors if you choose any point on the surface. One is going to be pointing up. And by pointing up, I don't mean straight up. I just mean that its k component will be positive. Or you could have another vector which is pointing down. And again, down doesn't mean straight down. It just means that the k component would be negative. Now, normally, we consider a this type of surface positively oriented when we're using the upward uh, unit normal. So if we say a surface is upward oriented, that means we're going to use the upward pointing unit normal. Now, if I have a closed surface, obviously z is not a function of x and y, but we have an inside and an outside. And so um, you have two possible normal vectors at a point, one which is pointing outside or outward facing, one which points towards the interior of the surface or inward facing. And we are going to take the outward facing normal as being a positively oriented closed surface. Now, most of our surfaces are going to be of one of these two types. Either it's going to be a surface that has, uh, it can be written as z equals f of x comma y. So there's clearly a top and a bottom to the surface, or we may have a closed surface, in, case, in which case there's an inside and an outside. Now, if we don't have that situation, so if it's not a closed surface, it's not a function of x and y, well, we use our parameterization and we just uh, normalize the normal vector uh, r sub u cross r sub v and take that to be the positively oriented normal, unless we're told otherwise. So we may be told that a particular surface is to be uh, oriented in the positive j direction. Well, oh, great. Now we know that whatever normal vector has a positive j component is going to be the positive 
uh, normal vector. That would be the normal vector that we want. And we should make a note that there are some surfaces which really don't have two sides. So they can't be assigned in orientation. It doesn't really have a top or a bottom or an inside or an out or a left side or a right side. There's just no way uh, to uh, distinguish two different sides. It really is a one-sided surface. And a famous example is the movie strip, which um, you know, hopefully at some point you've made one of these uh, what do you do? You just take a strip of paper and then you put a half turn. So you twist one end through 180 degrees and then you attach the two ends together and you get this strip right here. And if you were to take a pen and try to draw a line around it, you would find that you come back to the original point where you started. So you go here. And then, not quite sure. Oh, I got this. Okay, so I'd start here. Then I would actually be on this part of the surface. But then when I come back around, anyway, it's it's hard to look at at a, a two D picture and see that. But I encourage you to go ahead and make one yourself, and run your pencil around it, and you'll see. All right, so now we understand oriented surfaces. The next type of integral that we want to know is that's another surface integral, but how we find the integrand uh, has to deal with determining either the amount, the net amount of flow of a vector field out of a closed surface or through an open surface. In that case, we're only interested in the component of F, which is uh, orthogonal to the surface, meaning that it is in the direction of the normal vector. And so if we think about our uh, component formula, we would just take F dot N and divide it by the length of N, but N is a unit vector. So that just works out to be F dotted with N. So a flux integral of the vector field F across a surface S is a surface integral where the integrand is just F dotted with that normal vector. So it is the uh, component of F which is orthogonal to the surface. So if we work this out, uh, we know that ds is just the magnitude of r sub u cross r sub v dA in our parametric representation. And if we're using our normal vector as the normalized r sub u cross r sub v, then this magnitude divides out. And a formula that we have for this flux integral is that we are going to find the surface integral uh, where our uh, integrand in the parametric uh, space is just going to be the uh, dot product of the vector field in terms of u and v uh, with r sub u cross r sub v. Now, sometimes we abbreviate f dot n ds as just simply f dot ds, where we write the ds differential as a vector. It's simply a shorthand uh, for the normal vector times ds. So let's look at a couple of examples. And then I'll make a separate uh, video with even more examples. We're going to try to find the flux of the vector field with components z, y, and x across the positively oriented unit sphere. So positively oriented means it is a, the normal vector should be pointing out of the sphere. Well, in our previous example, 
uh, we had the same unit sphere and we had we used this parameterization and found that r sub phi cross r sub theta was the, that vector and sure enough that point is an outward pointing vector that's just the position vector times sine phi which is a positive number all right so let's write our vector field components in terms of uh, theta and phi so z is just cosine phi y is well sine phi sine theta and x is sine phi cosine theta so if i take that and dot it with my cross product r phi cross r theta i'm going to get well cosine of phi times sine phi cosine theta so sine squared phi cosine no sorry cosine phi sine phi cosine theta so i'll get that plus you now the y times itself so sine squared phi sine squared theta and then this is another uh, sine phi cosine phi cosine theta and i had this sine phi on the outside and that i'll just keep on the outside but then now i need to multiply it out collect the like terms and that is my integrand in the phi theta space so i'm going to go ahead and write this flux integral in terms of phi and theta so in my region is just a rectangle in the phi theta plane uh, the rectangle in the sense that the bounds on phi and theta are both uh, constants and so now i just need to evaluate this i'll uh, break this into two integrals i'm going to go ahead and write sine cubed phi as sine phi times sine squared phi and i'll replace sine squared phi with one minus cosine squared phi take the antiderivative with respect to phi and the first integral is just a u substitution so i would get two times one third sine cubed phi and when i evaluate that between zero and pi i'll get zero so this first integral is going to be zero uh, and the second integral antiderivative of sine phi is minus cosine phi and the antiderivative of um, minus cosine squared phi times sine phi will just be one third cosine cubed phi after a u substitution when i evaluate that between zero and pi i don't get zero for either term uh, but you have the one third here this actually works out to be four thirds so i'm left with four thirds uh, then the integral of sine squared theta d theta so i'll use my identity for sine squared theta and when i evaluate that i get four pi over three all right in our last example then we're going to try to find the flux of this vector field with components x squared xy and z across the upward oriented portion of the paraboloid z equals x squared plus y squared below z equals one so we're only taking the portion of the paraboloid below z equals one and we're going to orient it upward now sometimes uh, i forget to tell you the orientation and if i ever forget um, then by default all surfaces are going to be oriented in a positive manner so if I had forgotten to put upward oriented here, then our uh, default assumption is that it would be upward oriented because we'd want to have it positively oriented. All right, so um, let's try to go through this step by step. Um, somehow I managed to do something funny here. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So, back to our example three. Um, so, in this case, uh, the surface uh, is a function of x and y. And in our video on parametric surfaces, we said, oh, if we have a surface where z is a function of x and y, we can parameterize it using x and y as our parameters. And then the cross product of r sub x cross r sub y is just the negative of f with respect to negative partial derivative of f with respect to x, then the negative partial derivative of f with respect to y, and then in the k component we just have 1. So I can go ahead and uh, find the partial of f with respect to x, the partial of f with respect to y. Notice that this is indeed upper orient, upward oriented. We should always make that check to make sure we got the orientation correct. What would happen if we had the wrong orientation? We would just multiply this vector times negative 1. Or alternatively, we could just change the sign of our final result. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, write our uh, vector field in terms of x and y only. So I'm just going to replace z with x squared plus y squared. And I'll dot that with, uh, it shouldn't be r, and I apologize. You know that that really should be my r sub x cross r sub y. All right, so we will have to make sure we make that replacement on the next pages. Okay. Here we go. When we take that dot product, this is going to be our integrand then. And what is our domain of integration? Well, it's just this unit disk. So give me a moment to make my correction here. There we go. And that unit disk, of course, is a polar region. Right. So we're going to convert everything to polar. And we'll take, start taking the antiderivative. So let me go ahead and make one more correction here. And when I evaluate that first antiderivative between 0 and 1, I will get the following expression, which will evaluate to pi over 2. So I'll make uh, another video, and uh, it will be available soon. Uh, with more examples, uh, step-by-step -step examples of these
surface integrals, whether they are just regular surface integrals or flux integrals.